Welcome to Sound of the Yellow Horn, where faith, tradition, and philosophy meet the modern world. Here is your host, Mark Greer. Welcome to the show, everyone, and hail the gods and goddesses. I'm your host, Mark Pereer, and we want to welcome you to The Sound of the Gyaller Horn, which is a rehashing of a show we did a long time ago. My wife and I, we were the hosts of the show, and uh, this show, you know, we featured on a couple of radio stations, and it was it was a big part of our lives. It was something that we, we decided to do to, to serve our folk community, and we had a bunch of different segments, and we did interviews, and we had mead reviews, and we had a lot of different um, different aspects of the show that we brought uh, brought forth and these um this ended up being a lot of work for us i mean we you know we have a family we have a large family and we work and you know we, we we're trying to make everything kind of balance and it ended up being a little bit much for us so we had to put the show on hiatus for qu- quite a while um but we decided a few months back that we were going to start looking back into rebuilding it and uh, resetting it up and um we wanted to make sure that when we did it, that it didn't become too big of a deal for us, that we couldn't handle it once again, you know? So we're basically rehashing the show, reformatting it. Uh, one of the things that you're going to notice, um, is that we're kind of streamlining the show, mo- focusing more on just the straight, you know, philosophy and tradition and faith. And we took, you know, taken out a lot of the segments. We're basically just going to have one segment each week. This is going to be the tradition of the week. We're going to showcase a tradition each week that we will feature, you know, discussion and and have uh, lore and talk about some of the symbolism behind it and some of the ideas behind uh, the, the, the concepts of it that allow us to understand and relate to these traditions so that we can pass them on to future generations with a greater understanding of what they mean in our lives. And but as far as the main show goes we're going to go over different concepts of philosophy we're going to talk about politics we'll talk about religion we'll talk about all different uh aspects of our faith and how it manifests in the modern world and uh because this is a, this is a big deal for all of us and and you know rebuilding and reforging this bond to our ancestral gods and to our ancestors and and so you know it's 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 a big thing and for us you know, we're really, really proud and happy to be a part of the Northern Runes Radio, and we thank Daniel Updike for helping us to get on his uh, wonderful radio station. Uh, we want to thank Jesse Conley for helping us to get some of our promotional promotional materials, which we're going to be working on in the future here. Um, we want to thank all the members of the Norna Society, who you know are such a great crew, and we're really happy to be um, you know connected with all that and building this you know wonderful organization from the ground up. And so, you know, basically we're going to have the show as a a format for presenting our research, presenting our materials, presenting our philosophy and showing people what folkish, Osirtru or Odinism is really about. And, you know, breaking through a lot of the misconceptions, breaking through a lot of the uh, misinformation that's out there about it that tries to put it in a negative light or puts it in, in sort of an overly romantic light. I mean, we want to we want to just get down to the bare bones here. So that's what we're going to do. All right. So our first main topic uh, we're going to be discussing in our rehashing here, uh, we're going to go into a discussion that I presented recently at the um, Odinic Rite Midsummer Moot um, a few weeks back. Um, It was a really great gathering. I want to thank everyone for inviting us and let us being a part of that, Um, letting, letting us have a presence there. It was just a wonderful gathering. We had, uh, you know, current ordinations and we had we had uh, uh namings and we had professions and and it was just really great really great gathering um really great group of people and the, the discussion that i was allowed to uh present there was on a topic that i feel is very very important uh, it's very important for us to understand the world that we're living in and why certain things are happening why things take place and happen the way that they do so when we're looking at these these different things that happen, we have to break down like why do we see like such hypocrisies? Why do we see people who say one thing and do another thing? Why do we see all of these contradictions in our lives and and see like this that are really just resulting in 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 a really great amount of chaos in our world? And 
in order to understand this, in order to understand this, we need to go back into the history of it. We need to go back into the philosophy of it and really, truly start breaking it down. And we can break it down into two main concepts. And that is your tangibles versus your abstracts. Now, your tangibles is, is primarily what heathens connect to. Heathens relate to the, um, their tangibles, which is their family, their community, their folk, their country, their children. Even in the lore, when we look at our gods and goddesses, you know, the gods and goddesses have very, um, they have uh, tangible attributes. Odin with his one eye, Thor with his red beard and his hammer, you know, Balder with his white brow, the goddesses with their white arms, Sif with her golden hair. They have tangible attributes that allow you to, to envision them and understand them. And one of the great things, you know, that we were accused of and people were attacked for was idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? Idolatry is creating a tangible for divinity. So in contrary to that, you have your abstractions. Abstractions are just ideas. They're concepts. They're <clears throat> words on a page. They aren't anything that connects you to something that is real. And these abstractions allow you as a person to be manipulated because an abstraction can be made into anything. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. It, it, there's a cult of personality that develops around the, the abstraction. And this cult of personality has existed for hundreds of years. We really first saw its, its growth as a movement under the monotheistic religions, under the Abrahamic religions, when a group of priests can develop a, a belief system that is so abstract and so ambiguous that only they can interpret it for you and they present it to you and they tell you how to believe because it's so abstract. Now, when you have a, um, when you have a belief system that's built around tangibles, which is what heathenism is built upon, which is what the old ways were built on, you know, my family, my community, my folk, you know, you can't manipulate that. You can't come to me and tell me that my wife says this and therefore I must act a certain way. No, because I can just go ask my wife. But if you tell me that some writer who's been dead for 200 years spoke this certain way and you should believe like this if you want to be a good follower, then yeah, then you can be manipulated. You can, I can get you to do anything I want you to. You can actually manipulate people to the point where you can just create and move civilizations and societies how you want them to move what you want to happen. So you manipulate them. You take away their tangibles. You take away it where they're just completely infused in the abstract world. Now, the, an example of this is recently there, there was a story I read where there was a, a young woman in, in, I believe it was in Germany, where um, she was sexually assaulted um, and she didn't want to come out and tell people uh, who sexually assaulted her or, or the ethnicity of the person that she sex, sexually assaulted her because she didn't want people to use that as a means to attack that specific ethnicity. And I'm sure people know the story and know what I'm talking about. But the, um, the, she actually said in her quotes that she still believes that sexual assault and rape are, are products of society. Now, here it is, a, a belief system where you have a, a physical, tangible human being with motivations, with, with hate or whatever inside of his heart that drives, you to the, drives him to the point where he sees you as just a, a, an object, a thing, and he comes and attacks you and rapes you or sexually assaults you, and you don't see that as a tangible. You see that you want to relate it to an abstraction such as society. Which is whatever. You can make that anything. I say society. Well, society is this. Society is that. Because, this, this, I mean, this isn't anything that you can lay your hands on and touch and, and, and make it into something that's real. And we see this throughout history. I mean, when Christianity developed, it, it actually developed as a mystery cult. And you can actually talk to some Christians today and they will tell you that um, these belief systems are, you know, they're, the more you don't understand it, the more spiritual it is. And that's what a mystery cult is. That was the whole concept behind that mystery cult is that the, the more mysterious it is, the more spiritual it is, the more you are connected to God. 
And so you have this omnipotent divinity, this, this, that you can't understand. You're not even allowed like, like in Islam and uh, you're not even allowed to have images and you, and it's considered blasphemy throughout it. No images, no, uh, iconography, no, um, any kind of relationship or tangibles to the being itself. It must be abstract. It must be something that you cannot understand. It must be something that you cannot relate to. So you just pray to it and, and wish for the best, right? And even the concepts behind it of sin and, and religious law and stuff like that, they, they're all very ambiguous and they're all very, there's, there's, I mean, there's some of them that are direct, you know, but like don't thou shalt not kill and stuff like that. But there's a lot of them that are just, just weird passages in the Bible or the Quran or the, the, the Torah that tell you all these different things that, you know, can be made one way or another because they're abstractions. They're, they're meant to be abstract. It's built upon the idea of abstraction. And it was a complete and absolute rebellion against the tangible concepts of heathenry, where gods and goddesses were made into images, where they were made tangible, where they were seen as an extension of the clan or tribe of the family. And they had families themselves. They lived as actual beings that procreated and created lives and had adventures and did great things. They were tangible. They were real. And so you replace that with something that isn't real, that is that that is so contradictory and so bizarre that you can't make heads or tails of it. So you say that the not making a heads or tails of it is what makes it make sense, which is insane. I mean, it's, I don't understand how anybody can believe that, but it's fine. I mean, if people believe how they want to believe that's, that's your business, but I, I'm just trying to make reason behind it to understand the logic behind this. And really what I see is elitism. This is the elitism throughout history. Let's move forward in time to communism, um, the socialist movement, the Marxist movement. The Marxist movement is developed completely around the idea of ridding yourself of all tangibles. Borders don't matter. Sovereignty doesn't matter. Culture doesn't matter. Um, identity doesn't matter. Family doesn't matter. Community doesn't matter. Folk doesn't matter. None of these things matter. The only thing that matters is the idea. The belief system, which is abstract, which is something that a, an elitist can take and, and literally turn you into a puppet with because they can make it whatever they want to. They can, any of the ideas they are for, they can manipulate any ideas they are against. They can manipulate like, what is their great enemy? Their great enemy is inequity and racism and, and, you know, social issues. These are things that are just platitudes. They don't even, they, you could make, say what they are, whatever. They come to you and they tell you, oh, we're all about love and peace. And they don't even know what they're talking about. I mean, someone will tell you literally that they're about love and peace while they're rioting in the streets and killing people. And it's like, because it's just an abstraction. It's whatever we say it is. But when you talk about real love and real peace, the peace, the love of your family, the love of your community, of your country, these are tangibles. These are real things, real things that you can touch and feel in your hands and you know this is something that I really can connect to, then that makes you grounded and that makes you strong because then you're not easily manipulated. And that's why the elites hate people who embrace their tangibles. They want people to break away from their tangibles and embrace the abstracts because the abstracts make you puppets. I'll give you an example. The best example you can have is modern art. Now, modern art is literally the idea that you can take anything and say it's art. You could literally vomit on a canvas and say it's art. I saw in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, considered one of the best art museums in the world, there was a guy who had painted a two by four white and nailed a white rope to it. And that was art. That's all he did. It was like a two inch piece of rope nailed to a, a six inch piece of two by four. And it was all painted white. And that was art. Now, why was it art? Why is that considered talented? Why is that considered something that people should respect or revere and put in one of the greatest museums in the world? Well, it isn't because it actually takes talent. I mean, you see some of these things, you know, you go into museums and you go into uh, look in the modern art section and literally there will be walls filled with paint, uh, canvases that are painted a solid color. Now, I want to ask you this. Anybody who 
appreciates modern art. I don't know anybody who does, but let me ask you this. If you paint a canvas, a solid color, and that is considered art, then how could it not also be considered art, the solid wall that has been painted right behind it? I mean, that was just an average Joe painter who painted the wall a solid color, and then you put a, a canvas a solid color on top of it, and one's art and the other one's not. The reason why is because you've been, people have been manipulated into saying that it's art. That this is, this is abstract art. It's so wonderful. And these people are geniuses. And they're not. They're not geniuses. They're idiots. And the, the whole idea of modern art is an, is an insane concept that's just built around elitists telling you what to do. And say and believe and think. And all, all, all a lot of the modern, um, a lot of the modern entertainments and, and media are filled with this. Look at the Oscars. Oscars, 99% of the movies they put are garbage that no one watches and no one cared about and all flopped because no one saw them. But they give them Oscars and say they're the greatest film ever and they're just, they're, they're crap. So the, uh, the idea is to, you know, they call it abstract art. It's called abstract art because it's something where someone can just come to you and say, you must like this. And we say it's good, so you must say it's good. And so people who want to feel smart want to sound smart when they are, uh, when they are looking at this, you know, they want to connect to the elites. So they're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's great. This art is wonderful. It's so amazing. And it's all just the emperor wears no clothes. Emperor wears no clothes is the perfect example because here you have a King an elitist who's walking around naked telling everybody he's wearing an invisible cloak. And you should believe that because he's the King, not because he's actually wearing an invisible cloak. He's walking around naked. But he's telling you, I am the king, so therefore you must believe that I am not naked. And most of the mob does. Until one guy steps up and says, hey, I think the king's just naked. I don't think he's wearing an invisible cloak. And so that's, that's really what it is. The, um, th th that you're man being manipulated. You're being fooled into believing all of these abstracts. And there's only one, res one solution. There's only one solution. All these people come to you online and they, they, in books and all that stuff. And they tell you all these solutions, all these different things that we can do to turn things around, make, make everything wonderful and change everything and bring it back to the way it was or whatever. Right. And they, and the only solution, the only solution is to go back to your tangibles, have more children, have big families, connect to your family, connect to your community, connect to your country, connect to your tangibles. And break away from the abstracts. Break away from the things that, that take you away from things that truly matter in life. You know, you see all of this, this chaos all around us. And, and it's because people who are manipulated, they get angry. Because the world doesn't see the way they want them to. And they want the world to embrace their idea. And that's why we see all of this insanity. We see all of these contradictions. We see all of these things that happen... Because these are people who are, first of all, be dri being driven by those in power. And second of all, they're people who are just, they ha they've lost touch with reality. They've lost touch with reality because they've lost touch with those tangibles. When you've rejected your family, you've rejected your community, you've rejected everything, you have nothing left but yourself. Nothing. You can say that you believe that you love humanity, but when you say you love everything, I love all people, all things, all countries, everybody. Then you're really just saying that you love nothing but yourself. That you feel stronger connected to yourself than anybody. Because these, these are nothing. When you say you love everybody, it means you love nobody. Because everybody is just a word. You know, you walk up to some guy on the streets and give him a big hug and say, I love you. And, then you, and even if you did that, even if you really did that, you'd walk away and you'd never talk to that guy again. Because that's not your family. That's not your community. That's not someone that relates to you on a physical level. It's just not, that's just not how it works. So stick to your tangibles. Stick to them strong. And the more that you stick to your tangibles, the stronger you will be. The stronger your community will be. And the stronger your family will be. The Tradition of the Week. All right. It's time for our Tradition of the Week. This week we're going to be talking about the Nornagraut, which is the Norns porridge. 
It's a Scandinavian tradition spread throughout the region. Um, this is a, a special meal that is given to the mother right after she has her child. And this meal consists of a porridge. This is what Nornagrot means, the Norn's porridge. Um, it has several other words, that, but it usually has a connection to um, grains or stuff like that, more of a mundane term. This is an actual religious term, something that we would connect to our faith and to our beliefs and our lore. And, you know, the Norns, um, we know that they are present when a child is born. They give the, hem the Hemingia or the Filgia. Um, you have the three Norns, uh, the past, Erd, and present, Verdandi, and Skuld, the future. And they have a sort of connection to fate, a connection to destiny. They give what's called the mana mutud, the, uh, the fruits of fate and the, the destinies of men. They weave the, we the web of weird. They weave the destinies of men into the stars or whatever. And this weaving is uh, basically a connection to our, our destiny, to our fate, to our weird. And it's, and it's, it's an important symbol because what it teaches us is the sanctity of life, the sanctity of life that we, we honor and cherish the life that we're given. I mean, the day that you're born is the, your literal birthday. It's the most important day of your life because it's the day your life begins. And they say that the two days that you actually have a, the strongest connection to the Norns is the day you're born and the day you die. So the, um, the day of birth is, though, is typically more sacred for the mother. This is the time that we take care of the mother. The mother is focused on taking care of the baby. And all the other folk gather to make sure that the mother is okay. She's just gone through a very strenuous event. She's gone through something very, very traumatic and, and something that is definitely taking a toll on her body. Now, what's interesting about this tradition is that the, um, when, you know, we recently had our, our child, Emma, and when she was born, um, the doctors told us that, you know, when we were using this tradition, when we were presenting the Norna Grout and, um, you know, my wife is going to eat it, the doctors actually asked, they wanted to know what she was eating. And they told us that in medical school, they're actually told that the first meal a woman should eat after uh, giving birth is a, an oatmeal or a porridge because the oats, you know, it's easy to keep down. It's not too harsh on the stomach. It provides a lot of nutrients, a lot of things that, uh, that, you know, transfer into her milk that go into the baby. And so it's an, it's an important meal for them to have. And so this, this tradition is not only uh, medically sound and scientifically sound, but it's also something that connects us to the Norns and to the gods and goddesses. Now, uh, one of the symbols that are, was used uh, to represent the three Norns were three sticks put into it. Um, you know, you can use a specific type of wood. You can use whatever you want to. Um, I would, you know, we wanted ours to be sterile, of course, so we used uh, coffee stirring sticks. But, uh, but the three sticks represent the three Norns and the three goddesses of fate who are there and present and bringing forth the luck and the, and the goodwill of the child. And these, these, this is the beginning of the life and the beginning of weaving that thread into the web of destiny. And the thread is, is significant. The thread is something that's philosophically sound because it represents our connections to the rest of the world that resonates throughout the world, that we are not alone, that we are not, we are not just an, uh, you know, walking along a path that is completely, uh, isolated from everyone else in the world, that we have relationships with others. And every time we have a connection to something, every time we touch something, every time we are involved with something, or we come across something that we are crisscrossing with those other webs, those other threads within the web. And we're going to continue to do that until the day that we die. And then we start over and begin a new thread within the web. And so this this idea of destiny is uh, very strong within this tradition. And it's very strongly connected to the Norns and their ideas as, um, or their symbols as um, goddesses of fate and destiny. <clears throat> now, the thing that, uh, that we could also look at is, that's interesting is um, we have uh, Frigga who's the goddess of motherhood and is also the goddess of the earth. So we can see uh, a relationship there as well because we'll have the grains, which are you know obviously harvested from the earth, and then we have this concept of motherhood. So that's, that's something that we can relate to as well. And 
one of the things that uh, we did when we uh, celebrated this tradition was we also looked at the world tree, Yggdrasil. We considered that to be a strong component of the tradition because the Yggdrasil is really the seed of life. It is the seed of, of uh, the terrestrial life that it was sort of arose from fire and ice and the spirit or air element combined to create this, develop this seed that became Yggdrasil. And Yggdrasil becomes the, the basically the foundation of the universe. And so this uh, idea was portrayed or symbolized within our tradition. Um, you know, we had, um, the we put honey on it, on the oatmeal to represent the sacred mead that comes from Yggdrasil. And we thought of the seeds that come forth that create the oats that we used. We actually used barley grains, which is the traditional uh, porridge. And so this idea, this relationship with the Norns and with Destiny and Frigga and with the uh, World Tree are, are all profoundly represented within this, uh, within this porridge that represents the beginning of life. And the, uh, the idea um, from this is that the child has sort of recreated or re-represented uh, the symbolism behind Ask and Imbla, who were the, you know, the, the beings that were created by Odin and his brothers uh, from trees. And so they're, they were given the divine gifts, the gifts of, you know, Und and Odur and Lidurgoda and, and all the gifts that were given by the three brothers. And this happens again and again through every child, through the fruits of faith that are they say they're born on fire to women who are about to give birth. And so these divine gifts are now presented. They're now given to the child and they're now part of the child's life. And um, in ancient times, it was a, um, you know, a lot of people like to look at the savagery of our ancestors or whatever, but they, um, they actually had a practice of leaving out and or exposure is what it was. And exposure was basically, you know, back in those days, a child would be, was not considered to have a soul for nine days. And that's nine day period was after that nine day period, they were given their name. And from the name also was given a gift. Now this means that that's why there's a focus more on the mother during this time, because this is a period of uncertainty for the child. Um, this isn't a time when we're looking at these ancient traditions. We're not looking at a time of modern medicine. We're not looking at a time when, you know, mortality rates were a lot higher or, or a lot lower then as they are now, which are much higher. Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty about whether or not the child was going to live. There was a lot of uncertainty about whether or not the mother was going to live. So there was that importance. You know, the mother was already an established part of the clan of the tribe. And so her life was valued more at the time so that's why there was more of a focus on her health and, and bringing her about so that she could take care of the child to get that child through those nine days so that the child could be named and given the gifts which are a representation of acceptance that this child now has rights this child is now a part of the clan this child now has a real destiny that is really you know this is when the web of weird is was thought to actually begin and the reason why it wasn't because of savagery is because a lot of times kids didn't live. They just, they, they had sicknesses. They had, you know, all sorts of problems and they couldn't go in and do sonograms and check them out and find out beforehand. So they had to have this period of basically discovery of, of understanding and of looking at the child and, and uh, examining and, and seeing if there were any problems that were going to arise because you know, if you had problems, a lot of times you couldn't take care of them. You, you just couldn't afford to take care of them, so you would expose them. And exposure was sort of a, um, a uh, or thought, was thought to be a humane decision to make. The reason why is because you didn't actually kill the child. You just sort of left the child to destiny. And that's how a lot of myths came about, about children being way, raised in the wilderness or being raised by trolls or raised by wolves and, you know, different, different stories that developed over the centuries that represented this, this idea of exposure, which was such a, probably, you know, had to have been such a heart rending experience for, for our ancestors. So this, uh, this, concept is developed through 
the notion that we have to take care of the mother. Uh, now we live in a different time now, and we really we just celebrate we celebrate this tradition to bring forth both the health of the child and the mother. And there's no idea of exposure or anything like that within our religion or any concept of that. But we do, cons you know, you know, want to look at the history and understand the history and understand why they did certain things and how the symbolism developed around them. And so, you know, one of the things that we also did as part of it, we left, uh, we left a little bit of the porridge for the Norns. We left, uh, a, you know, a libation or a, an offering of, of it to them. Um, we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, that we did the tradition in a way that was respectful to these traditions, that was respectful to the goddesses of fate so that our child would have good luck. And so our child you know, will grow up strong and beautiful. And she already is. She's an amazing kid. And she's like so rambunctious and she's just all over the place. And it's amazing. And so this, this is something that hits home to me because, you know, and should hit home to any parent because this is the life of your child. This is the life of your kid. This isn't just, you know, having a little quaint tradition and, oh, it's so cute. And we're doing this. This is something that, that represents the good luck and well being of your of your the mother and the child you know of your uh, husband it's of your wife or of, you're the mother of yourself and and of the life of your child and for us it's it's a very significant thing it's a very significant moment to be able to have a tradition that represents the, the coming into life the coming into the world and so this is something that we share uh, with other people so that you can make this a part of your life, that you can make this significant for you. And so, you know, we present these traditions and we tr present these ideas for our folk so that they can uh, expound upon them and, and use them within their families and have a profound connection to their ancestors and find benefit within these traditions. Because that's really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, is finding benefit within them. So we have uh, our wiki, which has uh, got some of these, you know, traditions on them. We have the Norna Grot up there. Um, it's uh, nornawell.org. That's www.nornawell, N-O-R-R-O-E-N-A-W-E-L-L, -L, it's all one word, .org. And this is, uh, you know, our online wiki that we're trying to grow. We're trying to get more, um, trying to get more essays and research up there. Um, just adding it as it goes um we just recently had a um uh, an addition to it not too long ago uh about the german pots that carl parker uh and uh kirsten valkyrie put up which we appreciate and this is uh there was uh discussions about the connection between that and the norna Grot because uh, these pots would have been significant and passed on through generations and you know represent motherhood and grandmotherhood and family and all that and and, you know, we want to really use these traditions to bolster the family, which is the epicenter of our faith, and to, to bolster the idea of, of, of parenting and having as many children as possible, because that's really, really the, uh, the key to it all. Um, so check out the nornawell.org. Um, check out our, our website, www.norna.org, uh, N-O-R-R-O-E-N-A. Or you can email us at nornasociety at gmail.com, N-O-R-R-O-E-N-A, society at gmail.com. It's all one word. Um, and, you know, shoot us a line. We, we want to hear from you. We want to hear uh, ideas you have, concepts, research. Um, we want to be able to continue to expand our operation. We want to continue to expand our work so that we can help people and we can, you know, help grow our faith and use our faith as a tool to improve people's lives. And we're so proud and so honored to be here and doing this stuff and we're going to keep doing it, you know. So that that's really our show for the day. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us. We're happy to be here on Northern Ruins Radio. And we want to give everyone a farewell and good night and hail the gods and goddesses. A terrible dream I pray there be no ill You let him grieve Who lies captive